Hello YouTube, welcome back to the channel. Today I'll be checking out why Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. I've always been wondering this, like I've watched a lot of World War II videos and one of the videos I actually watched I was like, why didn't Japan try to support their allied or is it Axis, you know, member, Germany? Why didn't they do that? Instead of going on an expedition to go and attack Pearl Harbor owned by the United States in Hawaii. I mean, it made no sense. I know at that time the US was not the hegemony that they are now, but I think that was a wrong decision at that point in time. So some people told me in the comments some of the reasons why that was the case, and those were good enough reasons for me, but uh, I was still on defense. So hopefully this video is going to elaborate the whole reasons why they actually did that, why they actually made that move, why they actually decided to abandon let me not use the word abandon but not fully support their their ally during the war by trying to attack the soviet union i know that would have been a very difficult uh, situation for them but it's a war you could lose so that's why it's a war so i actually felt that was a bad decision but i wasn't there so i don't really know how they how they were thinking at that point in time right so let's just see what this video has to say about it if you are new hit the subscribe button and if you love this reaction hit that like button to help me out guys to get this video out to more people i really appreciate it let's get right into it on the 26th of november 1941 a japanese attack fleet consisting of six aircraft carriers two battleships and hundreds of aircraft departed from japan and began the long journey to an assembly point 230 miles north of the hawaiian island of oahu their target the u.s pacific fleet anchored at Pearl Harbor. Scheduled for the 7th of December, the attack would take the Americans by complete surprise, paralyzing their fleet for months and costing thousands of lives. However, the attack would also change the course of the Second World War and spell ultimate doom for Imperial Japan. So why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor in the first place? And how did Japanese miscalculation in planning the attack doom them to defeat in the Second World War? Well, to answer that question, we first need to go back to the 1930s. So Japan had spent much of the early 20th century uh, modernizing its economy and its military. So basically they wanted to build an empire, uh, sort of like that of Great Britain and the United States. And from that they could extract natural resources, um, exploit labor and build new trade routes uh, and become one yeah. of the world's great powers. But while Japan had big ambitions, there was one huge problem. The Japanese mainland did not have the natural resources required to build that empire. Japan needed to get its hands on more coal, iron, and in particular, oil, to make its ambitions. I mean, that is true. Japan is probably one of the most barren lands in the whole world, at least from what I know. Probably one of the most barren lands. Like, there's literally nothing there. Or is there? If there's anything in Japan, guys, tell me down in the comments, because the, the last time I looked at a, a natural resource map, Japan was basically like barren, like nothing there. So maybe there are some things that are available. Like some of these countries that don't have natural resources, I actually feel sorry for them sometimes. Most especially countries like Japan that have this ambition, have this ambition to make their countries to be what they are. Like Japan is a great country currently, like highly developed. Everything that you will want in a first world country is in Japan. So not having resources was always going to be difficult. And also part of the reason why the Europeans had to leave their continent to go out to other uh, continents. If not, they would have had an issue. That is why the US is so unique when it comes to imperialism. Like other countries that have resources like that, most of them are kind of poor. For example, in Africa, that have all these resources, but they are poor as fuck. In the Middle East, yeah, in the Middle East, life is good for the main citizens like the indigenous people but for other people not so great so the u.s is like the only country that actually has imperialistic ambitions but also has the resources to back it up so the, so they want to be imperialist so they can also go out there and cause havoc like other people used to do but they also have their resources like they could actually stay in their country and do what they want to do the, I, I think that's why that's why us and russia is kind of unique because russia also has resources as well us also has resources these two countries can just sit down there and like okay yeah it's not ideal 
but they could actually sit there and be individualistic and not care about the, the outside world and they'll be fine at least from the resources i saw maybe the other things that you need at the end of the day each country you always need you need each other that one is for sure it to never stop but when you have these resources you have bigger higher leverage when it comes to trade iron and in particular oil to make its ambitions a reality it was 1931 when Japan took its first major step towards empire building, invading the Chinese province of Manchuria. Now Manchuria had many of the resources that Japan needed and gave them a firmer foothold on the Asian continent for future advances. Over the next few years, Japan poked and prodded its way further into northern China before all-out war broke out between the two in July 1937. First, things went very well for the Japanese. They won victory after victory, all the while carrying out major atrocities like the rape of Nanking and the terror bombing of Chinese civilians, which drew widespread international condemnation. By 1939, though, the war had descended into a stalemate, and as the Chinese grew in strength, the war became a serious drain on Japanese manpower and supplies. To win, they would have to look elsewhere for the resources they needed. Okay. Meanwhile, across the Pacific, the US sense. was looking on with mounting concern. After the USA's participation in the First World War, uh, they start to adopt a unofficial policy of non-interventionism and isolationism. So this basically means that they won't go to war for uh, their allies or even get into alliances in the first place. And they, they won't even provide aid either. And this actually starts to become official policy in the mid-1930s when the U.S. Congress starts to pass a series of neutrality acts. But as Congress was passing these acts, uh, the world around the U.S. was getting a lot more violent and unstable. So though America had began the 1930s as a bastion of isolationism, the outbreak of war in Europe, as well as Japanese atrocities in China, brought a gradual shift in public opinion back towards interventionism. That allowed US President Franklin D. Roosevelt to sign a new Neutrality Act into law in 1939, which permitted the US to supply arms to Britain and France if they paid for and picked it up in their own ships. This would later be followed up by the far more sweeping Lend-Lease in 1941, which included China and the Soviet Union, and asked for no payment in return. So although the US mm. was still technically neutral, it was very clear whose side they were on. And for Japan, that was a huge problem. So the biggest resource that Japan needs at this point is oil. In 1939, all but 6% of its oil supply was imported, uh, with roughly 80% coming from the United States alone. Running out of oil would basically spell doom for their military campaign in China, as well as their other territorial ambitions. There were also a host of other natural resources that Japan needed but could only get through imports, uh, and that included scrap metal, coal, iron, all things that are vital to their war effort, and actually a lot of this stuff also comes from the United States. To get those resources and Damn. grow its empire, Japan had a choice to make between- the US, the US is just so rich, man. Damn, they have everything. The US, has, the U.S. has everything, actually. When I looked at that map, that resource map, the U.S. had everything. What became known as the Northern and Southern Strategies. The Northern Strategy was backed by the Imperial Japanese Army and involved taking the oil, coal and iron-rich areas in China, Mongolia and Siberia. The Southern Strategy, on the other hand, was backed by the Imperial Japanese Navy and instead involved striking south into British Malaya and the Dutch East Indies, similarly rich in oil and rubber. Hmm. By the mid 1930s, the northern. That is a great strategy, though. Put the army to land, put the navy on water. I mean, that sounds like some cliche statements, but it's actually a good strategy. The plan was already in full swing with attacks in Manchuria and China, and this had led to border disputes with the Soviets. These culminated in the huge battle of Kalkin Gol, in which the Soviet Mongolian forces won a major victory. Suddenly, Japan. Hmm had to reconsider its plans. 
So Japan's defeat at Kalkin Gol basically pours cold water on their plans for northward expansion into Siberia, uh, as does the signing of a non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and Germany in August 1939. When Germany invades the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa in June 1941, these plans for an invasion of Siberia are briefly reconsidered, but Japan is bogged down in China. Uh, they're running out of natural resources and, you know, it just doesn't happen. With the army bogged down in China, it was the navy who took up the mantle as Japan focused on its southern strategy instead. This began in earnest in 1940, when, in order to cut a key Chinese supply route, Japan entered the northern parts of French Indochina in an agreement with the Vichy French government. This worked in isolating the Chinese, but the US saw it as yet another act of Japanese aggression that threatened US interests in the Pacific. Coupled with Japan's recent alliance with Nazi Germany and Italy, the US responded by imposing an embargo on iron, steel and copper, all of which were essential to Japan's war industries and which were largely imported from the US. But the Japanese did not learn their lesson and occupied even more of French when that means the US are putting an, they were putting embargoes on Japan. Like Japan really had no choice if you look at it. Because at that point, the US, though they didn't declare war overtly, it was clear that they declared war on Japan. That's if you are being honest. It was, it's clear that they declared war on Japan. Almost like a cold war at that point. Indochina in July 1941 as a launch point for invasions further south. This time, the Americans responded even more forcefully. So this time, the US responds by freezing all of Japan's assets in the United States. And this prevents Japan from purchasing oil. And right after this, this is followed up by uh, Britain and the Netherlands, who control the Dutch East Indies, imposing... Sorry, sorry guys for pausing so much, but this is the reason why I've never understood why countries have assets in other countries, especially when you have um i don't know like what happened with russia and ukraine where russian billionaires assets or russian assets were being freezed in europe uh, i mean i don't think europe european countries have assets in russia do they i don't think so i don't think the u.s have assets in russia i don't think so so why would russians russia have assets in europe or is it because of the dollar? I know the dollar is the currency. I think that is part of the reason why the U.S. can't let go of that. They can't let go of the, um, that. The petrodollars being the the worldwide um, worldwide currency. I think that is part of the reason why. Because with that, just by having that currency alone being the worldwide accepted currency, it basically makes most countries to have to answer to the United States one way or the other. Get what I'm saying. So I think that's part of the reason why BRICS were considering starting their own currency, which I don't think they'll be able to do. To be honest, I think all this is just blowing smoke. They can't really do it because it's possible, but it's, it's going to be. Uh, it's to me, I will give it like a five percent chance or a ten percent chance that BRICS could come up with their own currency because I ju I just think the US has carried like controlled the whole world, the whole world world economy. And the dollar is going to remain the unofficial currency of the world. Oil embargoes of their own, so from purchasing oil. And right after this, this is followed up by uh, Britain and the Netherlands, who control the Dutch East Indies, imposing oil embargoes of their own. So in one fell swoop, Japan loses 94% of its oil supply. Japan was in a crisis. They first attempted to negotiate with the US, who demanded their immediate withdrawal from China and the tripartite pact. But for Japan, mm. accepting those demands was akin to complete defeat. Unwilling to give up their imperial ambitions, the Japanese felt their only option was to seize the natural resources they needed by force. That meant striking further south into British Malaya and the Dutch East Indies, who were both friendly with the US. Japan believed that this time, the US would almost certainly respond to their invasion with force of their own. The Japanese decided then that they had to blunt that US response by attacking the US Pacific Fleet at anchor at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. By attacking Pearl Harbor, Japan believes that it could severely cripple the US fleet and buy them time in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. 
So not only would they be able to launch their attacks without interference from the US, they would also have time to dig in defensively and consolidate their gains. So this is a really big gamble for Japan. Uh, they don't really actually gamble. believe that they can win a long drawn out war with the US. So their strategy really hinges on a short war. They believe that uh, the US probably won't have the stomach to fight uh, this costly war against a dug in enemy thousands of miles away across the Pacific and they would instead negotiate for peace, uh, allowing Japan to retain some or all of its captured territories. On December 7th, 1941, those plans were finally... I, I don't know, it seems like a, an okay plan, but that was con contingent on the US, on them believing that the US will not respond if they attacked them. Like, they would, have, they would just be like, oh, okay, we surrender. I mean, and the U.S. is not some small country. Like, I think that was a terrible decision. I know they didn't have any choice, but that was ultimately a terrible decision. ...be put into action. At 7.55 a.m., the first attack wave of 183 aircraft appeared in the skies over Pearl Harbor. The Americans were taken completely by surprise. The wave was separated into three groups. The first two groups of dive bombers and fighters targeted the hangars and parked aircraft at the island's airbase. The aircraft there were stored wingtip to wingtip to prevent sabotage, but that made them easy pickings for the Japanese. The other group of bombers and torpedo bombers targeted the ships in the harbour, in particular the battleships and battleship row. The Americans believed that the water was too shallow for a torpedo attack, but the Japanese had created a brand new kind of torpedo specifically designed for the waters of Pearl Harbor, and it had mm. a devastating effect. Within the first five minutes of the attack, four battleships were hit, including the USS Oklahoma and the USS Arizona, which exploded 10 minutes later, killing 1,175 of its crew. At 8.54, the second attack wave of 170 aircraft began their attack. They were also separated into three groups, attacking mostly the same targets. But with the base now on high alert, their attacks were less successful. In the space of just over an hour, the Japanese had sunk or damaged 18 American warships, including hits to all eight of the fleet's battleships. They destroyed 188 aircraft and severely damaged the base's infrastructure. Crucially though, the three all-important US aircraft carriers were out on maneuvers at the time of the attack and escaped oh, unscathed. Yeah, so because true. Japan are sort of anticipating this short war that's going to lead to negotiations, uh, their target selection focuses on the battleships, uh, which are going to prevent the US Pacific Fleet from coming out into the Pacific and Southeast Asia and stopping the Japanese. And they're not thinking about things like the fuel depots and the repair shops that are actually gonna allow America to pursue a longer uh, war in the Pacific. The shallow depths meant that any ships that sunk, they didn't sink far down, so they were uh, much easier to recover. Almost half of the deaths that day on the US side were from the USS Arizona when it was hit and exploded. Um, and the Imperial War Museum in London actually has a piece of the USS Arizona on display in its new Second World War galleries. And this is actually the first time that part of the USS Arizona has been displayed outside of the United States. Initially, the attack worked perfectly. On the same day, Japanese launched more or less simultaneous attacks in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Thailand surrendered within hours and quickly signed an alliance with Japan, while the US territories of Guam, Wake Island and the Philippines... Watched, yeah, in um, that video I watched... Um, mm, Geography now in Thailand, this was mentioned, the Japanese invasion. As well as the British territories of Malaya and Hong Kong all fell relatively quickly. And on top of that, two major British warships, the HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse, were sunk off the coast of Malaya by Japanese torpedo bombers. In the first months of 1942, Japan followed this up with attacks on the Dutch East Indies, British Burma and Singapore, New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. And just as they'd hoped, the US Pacific Fleet was unable to offer a response. The Japanese then had okay. completed their goal with speed and efficiency. They'd established their new empire and they finally had the natural resources they'd craved for so long. But there was one huge problem. So Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor pretty much has the opposite effect of what it was hoping for. Uh, you remember they were hoping for this negotiated peace. So the day after the attack, President Roosevelt 
uh, delivers his famous Day of Infamy speech to Congress in which he asks for a formal declaration of war against Japan, which Congress quickly authorizes. So the U.S. is officially now in the war. The vast resources of the United States, power, raw materials, industrial production, all had to be mobilized to meet the demands of total war. So support for isolationism quickly melts away. There's a rapid expansion of the U.S. military with uh, hundreds of thousands of men volunteering to join. And the economy is fully mobilized onto a Yeah, I think this period, this period of the U.S. history was depicted in this movie, Hacksaw Ridge. Great movie. I loved the performance by the actor, I forgot his name, Excellence Movie, where a lot of young... Americans were like, you know, trooping to volunteer to fight, you know, against the Japanese that period. That is crazy. Man. War footing. Japan's hopes for a short war uh, completely evaporate and they've now woken this, what many people call sleeping giant, and they're now committed to this long war in Pacific and Southeast Asia, which ultimately they'll lose. The Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor was a huge gamble and one which did not pay off. Japan's desire for an empire and the natural resources to go with it had slowly awoken the US from its isolationism. Bogged down in China and unable to attack the Soviets, the Japanese decision to strike south resulted in a US oil embargo, which gave Japan little choice other than to give up its ambitions or go to war. Their yeah, decision to fight no paid choice. off in the short term, but once the US had geared up its war machine, for Japan there was little hope of victory. Wow. Ah, this is interesting, man. World War II, World War II is the, like the most interesting war. Almost all the videos I've watched about World War II is just incredible, man. I know there were a lot of atrocities committed, but the stories are crazy. The stories are interesting. The stories are remarkable. <laughs> like, there's not much I can say about that. Seriously, it's crazy. But ultimately, when it comes to this, Japan had no choice. They had no fucking choice they had to do this because at the end of the day you could you could knock their ambition you could say look why do you want to form an empire why don't you just stay where you are but from what i've noticed in in history the ones i've learned on this channel and the ones i have read off this channel most countries that don't have resources in their own land most people that don't have resources in their own land they always went out to go and collect from other people that had that, that, that was just that, that is just human that is human that's just human behavior to be honest with you i know now we live in this civilized world where everything is peaceful uh, relatively peaceful and all that but make no mistake if there was no rule of law rule of all these things that is holding down humans i'm not sure if you have your own house someone can just come to your house and kill you take your wife kill your children like i'm telling you <laughs> This is what would happen, to be honest with you. Some of these lonely men that don't have wives or haven't had sex for 10 or whatever, how many years, you think they would just sit down there and suffer through it? I don't think so. I doubt that. So, um, that is just, uh, unfortunately, that is just life. And Japan don't really have resources. Last I checked the, uh, the resource map, Japan is basically barren. So, there was, there was nothing that they could do. The US could sit down there in their own in their own country and not even do anything they have everything there so it's easy for them to sit down there and do that but japan had no choice uh so it, this was really interesting world war ii is, was incredible man world war ii was so incredible um guys what do you guys think about this let me know what you think down in the comments um what do you think do you think japan made the right decision i think it was the right decision but a very very risky one it was kind of a uh, high risk, high reward situation. It was high risk because it, they were counting on the United States kind of being like, dude, we don't want to fight. We don't want to fight, just, you know. But there was high reward that came with it. So, I think it was a risk worth taking. Yeah. It was a risk worth taking. Sometimes you take the risk and you fail. It's what it is. See you on the next one. Peace.